I want to talk a little bit about the pros and the cons of working with investor clients. There are upsides to dealing with investors and there are downsides to dealing with investors. All right. Got a couple of real life scenarios that I'm going to use. So let's talk about the upsides first, the pros in dealing with an investor. These aren't in any order and I'm sure there may be others, but the biggest one to me for an investor is most investors treat this like a business. They treat it like a business because it is a business to them. It takes away the emotional factor that you see in a lot of, once again, mom and pop finger quotes, real estate. I remember I had a single mother selling a home the day before closing. She called me up crying in a panic. I can't sell my home. And I went over and I was talking to her and I said, okay, what's going on, Sue? This is the only house my son has known. And she had the little height chart marked up on the wall where, you know, I don't even remember little Johnny was two and three and four and there was a whole bunch of emotion and it was an emotional decision. Finally got her calmed down and understood that, you know, Johnny's going to live in a new place and better schools. And, uh, we went ahead with the sale point being on that particular one is that that whole conversation, that whole two hours was driven entirely by an emotion. Not so much chant, not so much business. Hey, does, is the rate of return 10%? I'll do the deal. Well, it's an ugly neon green. I don't really care. I'm making 11% on my money. Okay. So it is more of a business for investors, specifically in the commercial world where now it's 90% driven by business decisions, even less so about emotions. All right. And because there is less emotion, there's obviously less chance of a deal going south late in the game. Like Susan was, I mean, she wanted to kill the deal 5 PM the night before we were going to close. So <laughs> less emotion. The other th upside to dealing with investors is the old 80, 20 rule. How would you like 80% of your business to come from just 20% of your clients? Now you're not needing to gain new clients every day. You are not needing to spend marketing to find a new buyer, uh, on the mom and pop side because, Hey, I closed that deal. Got to find a new client. You're not spending a bunch of money on that. What's that Z word you guys use Zillow to buy leads because you have got a five or six investors and they're buying multiple properties every year. So 80% of your business now comes from 20% of your clients. What I just mentioned, one investor may do four, five, six, 10 deals a year, specifically if they're in that fix and flip strategy, which one creates two sides for you. You could help them purchase and then resell. So you've got one client doing two sides. Now that could be very common in the mom and pop real estate, but cause they're going to sell and buy, but here you've got this guy, plus you've got the added potential that they're going to buy multiple properties this year. Now you've got one client buying five properties and you've spent way less money in marketing, way less time in acquisition of a new client, way less effort because you have got one client that's going to buy five times. If they're in the buy and hold strategy, you now have a potential of the purchase and the property management if you so choose to. 
Another upside to working with uh, investors is less education of the process, all right? Now, when I say investor, and maybe we should have started this way back an hour ago, I am truly meaning a true investor, all right? Not a guy that's like, okay, this is my first deal, or I think I want to be an investor. I'm talking about guys that are truly investors. They already know the process. They already know the step. They know this comes next, then this comes next. Why? Because they've done it 16 times over the last five years. And because of that, they also may skip steps. They can short circuit certain steps in the process, like if they're a, a fix and flip, they may waive inspection altogether because I don't care. I'm taking the, everything down. I'm taking all the walls out. I'm going to redo everything. I'm putting in a new furnace. I'm putting in a new driveway, whatever. So there could be a chance that the whole inspection could be waived. The other thing, even though we spent about 20 minutes talking about it just a few minutes ago, is they could waive financing. They're a cash buyer. That allows you to get to closings quicker. So they need less education on the process as opposed to a brand new seller or a brand new first time home buyer, which we talked about in another class, how much education and handholding, and I called it the babysitting syndrome. Here is the other side of the coin. Very little babysitting syndrome, okay? The third reason that an investor might be good is because of referrals out the yin yang. And yin yang here is a technical term, by the way. Feel free to use that in your conversation. Because investors hang with other investors, you get one investor and you can help them acquire a property at a great deal. They are more prone to tell other investors in their investment groups or in their investment social circle to help you out. Not that mom and pop buyers and sellers wouldn't help you with referrals. Investors seem to have a stronger click with each other because they, in, they, they, they are in this group for the sole purpose of investing, all right? So there is a common bond, and if you do good on one of them, one investor, that they may pass your name to the other investor, all right? So now... Let's talk about the other side of this coin. What's the downside to working with an investor or the cons? Now up on the screen, I've got my slide and if you're at home, you can see the PowerPoint. Um, very first one, more of a business. <laughs> I see a lot of you out there flinching. Yeah, I know, I had that in the advantage, right? Well. It also has a disadvantage side to it because, because if it's more of a business, there are less urgency factors that play out with because of the lack of emotion. And what I mean by that specifically is that investors tend to work on business hours. Okay, I'm going to go look at a property or I'm going to, you know, do this, but we don't do it on the weekends. We, uh, after five o'clock, I'm going to uh, go home to my family. And maybe in my mind, I'm thinking commercial because for about five years, by definition, I was not a realtor. I had canceled uh, my membership with the NAR and all I did was commercial property didn't broker one house from about 09 to about 2013, somewhere around in there, 2014. So I did only commercial properties and maybe I'm uh, projecting the downside here because a lot of them were exactly like I just said. I don't do after five o'clock. I don't do showings after 5 p.m. I don't work on weekends. Now, I did the largest short sale in Indiana in the year 2011. I did $11.4 million short sale. We're not gonna get into what a short sale is. We're not gonna get into, maybe someone's done a bigger short sale since then. But at that time, it was a rather large short sale of $11.4 million. 
It was a condo building that had 37 units in it. So we had commercial lenders. We had other commercial developers on the other side. We had attorneys involved with both of them because of the foreclosure and the potential for the short sale and all of that going on. And the problem was we brought the buyer. I had the listing and I brought the buyer um, in like early February of the year. We literally closed that deal the day before Thanksgiving the same year. All right. Now, did I make a good commission? Hell yeah. $84,000 commission. Good year. One deal. Because I can tell you that there were at least five weeks in that time frame that nothing happened because the buyer slash developer was on vacation, the lender, commercial lender that we were dealing with uh, out of Cincinnati was on vacation and he flat out told us, no one touches my files while I'm gone. The attorney uh, happened to be, both attorneys actually were gone the same week. So because it was more of a business transaction, it, actually took tremendously long time to complete. So I put that in the downside because of the fact it is business, there's no urgency. Your mom and pop buyers like, dude, I wanna close tomorrow. I gotta get my kid in this new school district. We wanna start painting our house, yada, yada, yada. We love the neighbors, We're, Bob's close to work. All of that stuff now doesn't play out necessarily in the form of an investor trying to buy or sell. So it's more like a business. The other downside that I'm going to put in here <clears throat> is what they call the thief. There's a lot of investors that love to try and steal property. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't get a good deal. I'm not saying you shouldn't advocate your uh, buyer to try and get the maximum return by paying the least amount of money on a property. But there's always some investors that just want to try and squeeze that last drop out to the point of potentially costing them the sale. I had an interview with an investor buyer and he literally told me during our interview that I never pay list price ever. Whatever it's listed at, I always go in at 80% below that and try and get more money. My response to him was, what happens if it is fairly priced for that condition? $100,000 house, needs a bunch of rehab, they've got it marketed at 60. Are you telling me you still try and beat them up for another 20%? He said, yes, without a doubt. We wrote two or three offers that two of them were never even acknowledged as receiving because they were below, uh, so far below that they didn't even deal with them. One of them, they at least rejected, called back and said, no, man, we're not going to take that. I only wrote three offers with him and eventually fired him because in my mind, his strategy of never paying market price or the mark list price actually was more detrimental to him. And I guess looking back at it, sitting on his side of the fence, if I got Raymond doing all of my work, writing offers and submitting offers, I don't really care if I write 40 today. Well, that's what he wanted to do. First day he came into my office and said, I've got 16 properties I want to write offers on. So we talked about it and every one of those was like 70 and 80% of what that was listed at. Well, we ended up looking at one and subsequently got it rejected. And then we tried that two or three more times. And finally I said, look, dude, I'm wasting a lot of my time. I don't think you're ever going to find one that's going to be at 60, 70% of what it's listed at. And maybe I'm wrong and that's up to you. But I actually fired that buyer because to me, he was not a buyer. He was a thief. He was a, a, a thief buyer. 
Now, if he finds one out of 50, maybe he can justify that. Maybe you can justify that as being the agent. The other problem is you, if you're working for that buyer, specifically if you're in a market out there that is a smaller market, meaning everybody knows everybody, you can actually gain a reputation as being the agent that works with investors, but you could gain a reputation as being the agent that always brings the offer that's 50% of the list price. Oh God, I got an offer from him again. Well, that's not even going to go through. So that may be something you don't want to get, that reputation as well. And trust me, we all know that. We all do it right now. You guys uh, see some of you shaking your head. There are typically agents out there that gain a reputation. Maybe just not for investing. Maybe they're hard to work with. Maybe they can't close a deal. Maybe whatever the reason, you can't tell me that you haven't looked at an offer from another agent at some point and went, oh, crap. All right, don't become that agent. And this is one of the ways how you wouldn't become. So one of the cons is don't work for investors that are always trying to steal properties. Now I'm not saying they can't, just always trying to steal properties. All right, hold on.